Hi, good afternoon. My name is uh, Vivek Bore. I'm a startup lawyer, a partner in law firm Inventus Law. We're based in San Francisco, Palo Alto. Also have offices in Singapore and Bangalore. Soon to be opening those. And uh, I work a lot with uh, startups that are um, based in the US, also startups that are operating across borders. So this is a topic of great interest to me. And I'll just have the panel starting with you, Luke. Introduce yourselves and uh, also yeah, audience. Thanks, Vivek. I'm Luke Zakera. I'm originally from Goa in India. I now live in Canada, and I run a fleet tracking company back there. Uh, we are the uh, exclusive partner for Rogers Telecom, one of the largest uh, telecom companies in Canada, um, for all of their M2M business in the truck industry. Um, so I'm here to basically tell you about how we built that company uh, from Goa as our backyard, and why you don't really need to be in the valley to do things like that. Hi, I'm Charlie Haley. I'm an attorney at Cooley LLP, one of the bigger Silicon Valley law firms. So I cover uh, San Diego and Santa Monica, as well as national and international clients from Turkey and Israel and elsewhere. Uh, our firm has both big and small clients. I work with big clients who were once small like you, like Roku and Uber and Snapchat, and also with many small clients as well. So. And I'm Chris Napik. I'm originally from San Francisco, actually. I'm currently based in Berlin. I've been a founder. I've worked for a lot of startups around the world, uh, New York, San Francisco, Buenos Aires, Berlin. Uh, and now I work with startups mostly in Europe, uh, London, Berlin, and Kiev. Thanks a lot. And Luke, you, you uh, touched on a little bit. Could you go in a little, uh, talk about what it was like building some of these products you do across different yeah. borders, the obstacles you face and whatnot? Yeah. Well, uh, the key thing is to stay solvent, basically. Uh, if you don't live in the valley, if you don't have access to a lot of capital, uh, which is most um, uh, developing uh, startup um, communities, uh, your challenge is going to be, be to actually have cash flow in place to sustain yourself and your team uh, while you build out your product and you reach it to a point where you can actually make revenue out of it. So uh, my philosophy has always been, like, uh, do anything. Like, I've done everything from copywriting, um, ad optimization, um, coding, uh, even selling drugs sometimes, but you just got to do what you got to do to make enough money so that you can uh, keep the company solvent. Uh, that is step one. Um, the second thing is understand that you're living in a different time zone. The valley operates very differently from um, a startup community outside of it. Um, the rules of engagement are very different, so you can't be benchmarking yourself against com companies from the valley. You'll only end up feeling depressed and, and you won't have that kind of um, powerful state of mind that you need to go against the odds. So these are the, the two or three key things that I'm always thinking about as we build things outside of San Francisco. Oh, th thanks for that. And, and Charlie, uh, what, do, what do you see um, are, the, are sometimes the, the obstacles and, and, and practices and mistakes that your cross-border clients make? I think one big problem is not um, sometimes companies from non-US jurisdictions, they try and fight the established structure, which is archaic somewhat, but also yeah. important is there for a reason of how Valley investor firms see a small company. They want to see clarity around your cap table. They don't want to see, for example, that you've told your cousin, I'll give you 5%, because 5% is a floating number. It's always 5%, <laughs> yeah. right? So um, they don't want to see that you've committed to long-term contracts with one key customer that will eventually swamp you, if not today, then a year from now. So. You should be very wary of signing. I mean, you want the first big customer, which is important in a benchmark and its revenue, as you said. But it also can be a, a minefield. So before you sign the 50-page contract from Turkcell or somebody else, make sure you've read it carefully and thought through how to approach that from your own internal term sheet for your business, because they're very complex. And what are the differences you've seen building companies in San Francisco, New York, Berlin, wherever? Sure. I think. Um in many cases, it's an experience level uh, kind of thing. A lot of, uh, it's been mentioned actually on the stage earlier, a lot of companies in the Valley or in New York, they are made up of people who have done two, three, four startups. Um, it's a blessing and a curse. Outside of the Valley, I think you get a lot of people who are uh, new into the entrepreneurial game, but it's kind of nice because they don't know what they don't know, and so they're kind of going into this and, and building something fresh for the first time. Um, that actually leads to some amazing innovation. I guess, yeah, leading to that, um, what are the advantages, what are the opportunities you think that are outside of the Silicon Valley? Sure. Startup? I think the, the biggest part of a startup is the team. And building a team inside Silicon Valley is very difficult, it's expensive, there's a lot of competition. Um, outside the Valley, you have 
an absolutely large number of very talented individuals, uh, engineers, marketers, um, people who will care about your product and, and want, to, want to build it. Um, and I think you know, the ability to put that team together for rel rel relatively cheaply um, is a huge benefit. I guess, Luke, you've, you've done that. You're currently doing that yeah. you know, in UK, Canada, and India. Yeah. So what are, what's your experience been? I mean, talent is a big challenge, and attracting it outside of the valley is hard. And, and um, um, the, the thing is, uh, we, I was talking about this to a, a bunch of guys from Iran earlier today about how it's hard to find people within a city. Um, but what I try to do is I try to look at um, people from my community that are out in the valley or in places like that and see whether they want to move back to Goa. There's a huge opportunity back in India. Um, and if you can... Um, paint that picture to them, if you can show them that, well, you could be working in the Valley as, as some late stage employee at, at some uh, reasonably successful startup, or you could bring that knowledge back to your home base, uh, work with someone like me, ideally me, <laughs> and, um, and, and basically leverage that talent, that skill set to build something of greater value in which you'll have a larger stake. Um, and that sometimes tends to work. I'm, I've convinced people to move out of companies like Jaguar. Uh, my, form, my current uh, co-founders have been former heads of uh, search engine people back in Canada for their marketing division, uh, things like that. Um, I had no money to really compete against uh, the salaries that they were getting before that. Uh, it just came down to showing them the larger opportunity uh, and why it makes sense for them to be part of it. I guess that touches on a topic. Um, Charlie, you see your, your clients outside of the US how they approach equity and the fact that you know working for upside is a big thing with startups. Is that, have you noticed an evolving mindset? Uh, I think so. I think most of the people I work with, even those from not from the Valley uh, proper, understand how option plans work or more or less do. But I but I think the the bigger point is the one that you made earlier, which is which is you should focus on as far as differences of U.S. versus versus international cultures. There is a trend in the U.S. recently I've seen to copycat, as our, our project gentleman was saying about, about Intel Turkey. D don't, don't chase the next thing. And often I find my foreign clients have a crisp review of their own product base. Sure. I want to do this. Yeah. I'm not the next WhatsApp. I'm not the next Periscope. I do this particular thing very well. So that's actually, I think, more important than the equity stuff will, get, will sort of take care of itself if you avoid the basic traps about... Sure misstating and sort of promising things on a handshake basis. So what people in the Valley want to see is a crisp self-awareness of who you are and what you're building, which is rare these days in the Valley yeah. sometimes. And they want to see the absence of glitches in the paper trail. Sure, sure. So, so I guess what, what are the different opportunities you're seeing with the different kind of companies you're working with um, outside of the US that you're consulting? Um, what kind of unique opportunities? Sure. I mean, I think every market has its unique challenges, unique opportunities. Um, a company I'm working with in Kiev, for example, is um, working to benefit refugees from the war in the, in the East, for example. And they're building a marketplace um, that's actually helping uh, to employ some of these refugees. And it's something that's tapped directly into kind of the hearts and minds of, of people in Kiev and in Ukraine in general. And it's now um, you know, moving out into, into Western Europe and, and they're building a very successful business from this. It's not something that you could pull off in, say, Silicon Valley. It's just the, the relationship to the problem is not there. So. Yeah. I think uh, touching on that, I mean, I think one of the things I noticed with a lot of startups, especially places like India, parts of Africa and Eastern Europe, is that they're, they're solving something that are problems that are quite concrete. I think yeah. uh, right. you, know, you don't have to search for yeah. problems. It seems many times, sometimes in Silicon yeah. Valley, they're inventing problems. Do you, yeah. uh, you, know, you want to comment on that a little bit? Um, basically, look out for the unsexy problems, like the, yeah. the things that nobody else is interested in building. Um, like we have an application in, in the horse racing industry. Nobody looks at that market. Don't look at that market. Um, <laughs> Stay away. Uh, yeah, but basically, uh, you, you want to find opportunities that um, don't make sense if you're sitting in Silicon Valley where you can get a, a $2 billion valuation based on sharing anonymous pictures. Um, you know, like, uh, if, if you have that opportunity, why would you want to work yeah. in, in the horse racing industry where you've got to break your back to make a few sales? And the thing is, you make those few initial sales, you, you sign up a few race courses, and suddenly you're dominating an industry that nobody even looked at. I think that is, is sort of what you want to be doing. Uh, it's like the taxi driver. Like, if there's one taxi available to get you between your hotel and the airport, you'll pay him anything, no matter what he asks you for. You want to be that taxi driver. You pivot on your business model based on, on, on what the marketplace looks like. Um, and that's why I really appreciate how taxi drivers operate. I don't get upset when they, when they try to uh, scam me off of money. They're, they're just or hustling. Killing. Yeah, this is, this is how you should think. And this is uh, deeply ingrained in how we think uh, back in India. 
um, pivot on the business model as you need it. And just look at where you can innovate there. Don't try to reinvent the wheel, basically. Sure, sure. I think you bring up a good point. I mean, in a, in a lot of uh, these markets, there are, there's just a basic lack of infrastructure or, or common things that you would expect in Silicon Valley. I mean, there's a huge opportunity there to, to appeal to the masses. Yeah, and it also has, but it has a symbiosis with both parts of the equation. So by picking the right discrete project, the right niche market, you can prove out your idea, yeah. right? So in Turkey, we have a great, great well of deep knowledge of mathematics, engineering, big data analysis, data massaging. But often I will hear a pitch and I will think, okay, that's, you're smart people, but are you a consultancy or are you a product company? Yeah. And my mind wants to hear, I can fix this problem for this water company, right? Yeah. And beyond that, I can do 10 more things too. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an interaction. Make it something, a solution scalable. Right, but you can begin with that idea of having one market and, and mastering it. Yeah, yeah. master that market. Yeah. The thing is, once you do, once you do master the market, um, uh, investors will find you. Um, right. We raised our round of funding within three days. We literally made a few phone calls, and we got to a point where um, we needed to raise as little as possible, and we knew that we wanted to raise as little as possible to get us to the next stage. Um, we had a clear um, product in the market. We had clear traction, and, and we had the right contracts in place. And it was a no-brainer for the investors. Like nobody's going to ask you for a business model when you can show them a contract of eighteen million dollars. You know. Um, it changes the game completely when you do it that way. Um, and that's, that's how I feel it should be done. You, you should not, uh, I think the, the idea of uh, this company raised $5 million in, in their seed round, like, that is stupidity to me. Like, that is uh, just someone being lazy. There's many other ways in the Eastern world to earn an income. The cost of operating is quite low. Um, the opportunity is quite large. You can find ways to subsidize yourself and stay solvent uh, till you have product and traction, and then don't ask for the money. Just talk to investors, go to these kind of events, meet the, meet the right people. Um, they will get to know you, they will discover who you are, they'll kind of become a bit conscious of what you are up to. Uh, and before you know it, you'll have a term sheet. Like, I mean, it's not as simple as that, but that, that is a general trend. It's a, simple. You do it. It's simple, yeah. yeah, it's easy. Yeah. You, know, you mentioned product and traction, and I think uh, one thing that Silicon Valley has exported uh, that, that can be replicated anywhere is this build, measure, learn cycle. Yeah. Um, and it can be done right. very quickly, very iteratively, and very cheaply. Um, anywhere, and I think we saw a slide earlier that said, make Silicon Valley come to you, and in yeah. fact, you're seeing that now um, in certain markets where a couple of years ago, investors from the west coast of the United States would not go into, and now they're clamoring to get in, yeah. um, because the traction is starting to show up, the, the yeah. markets are starting to show up. Yeah. I think um, the other thing about investors is that Sometimes investors don't know that they are investors, um, and you've got to show them that they are. So for instance, <laughs> what we've done is we have this idea of standing on the shoulders of giants. So basically, um, when we need money, we will find um, an established company, an older one, that has a need that we think that we can fulfill. So we'll build a prototype in that direction, go and show it to them and say, and, and this has to tie back to what our actual product is, and say, we can implement this within your company, um, and uh, it will cost you so much per month to use it. Uh, but we give you free for the first five months, the first six months. Um, and then they, they begin to see the value behind what you're doing. And, and this is just a, a mild spin-off of your, your, of your main product. So in my case, uh, I'm in the Internet of Things industry. I need to sell sensors, and I make money based on selling of sensors. But I provide financial dashboards um, as an entry into some of the companies that I work with. And then I give them the opportunity to, to get this information in real time, buy these sensors from me. So I never entered the conversation saying I'm, I'm an IoT company selling sensors to you. I'm, I'm a company that gives you a dashboard to look at your assets and to make intelligent decisions based on that. So suddenly, my potential client who was not interested in Internet of Things, or did not even know what that was, is now interested in investing in what we're doing because he can see the real value coming from it. And that's when I say, okay, well, you could get in on this, and, and I will sell this to other companies like you. You have seen the value that it brings to you. Uh, but this is what I'm, these are all my terms. And suddenly, they've become an investor in your company, but they never saw themselves as one. So you're just going to guide them in that direction. Add value and then they'll want yeah. to. So I guess, Charlie, uh, have you noticed over the years that, you know, that your contacts in, in California and U.S. are showing more interest in, in startups outside of the U.S.? Certainly. I mean, I, our firm has seen a huge growth from Israel, for example, um, in the last five years of a, a client pipeline, an investor and friendship and law firm and consulting partnerships in, those, in, in Israel, Turkey now as well. Uh, Ukraine to some degree as well. Uh, Germany less so. I'm curious. I'm not sure why that is, but less so in my experience. But I would just say to the prior point that you made, I think it's important. It's a really well said to make sure you 
before you take money, understand why you're doing it yeah. and how you're doing it. Yeah. I mean, often valuation is a hard concept or hard topic. It's hard for investors too sometimes, sure. right? But getting the right term sheet at the right mechanics of converting the cash to equity yeah. is a crucial piece of your growth path for a growth company anywhere in the world. Yeah. And um, yeah, sorry, yeah. But when there's a lot of money available, it's easy to say what you need the money for. Um, I think the, the bigger question is, what do you not need the money for? Uh, what are you not going to do with the money? So are you going to put that money towards building a 200-person sales team with a, with a cold calling uh, call center? Um, are you going to put that towards Google AdWords? What exactly are you going to do? And more importantly, what are you not going to do with that money? So we know what we won't do. Um, we don't build sales teams. We don't have sales guys. We'll never spend investment money on that. We believe that we should build partnerships that sell our products. So that's always going to be the way we sell things. So when we talk to investors, we say, um, they, they may ask us, so, so why do you need um, uh, this amount of money? And we'll say, well, we definitely don't need it for these things. And the things we do need it for are to bring in the right kind of talent to build our product at this stage and to pay for the bills, for the meetings, and the, and the partnerships that we are striking with the people around different parts of the country. Um, and I think when you have little money and, and you begin to think in those terms, um, you put yourself in a stronger position. Yeah, I don't know if you've noticed this, but in some ecosystems, out, well, even in the Valley itself, people just view the next round of funding as like the yeah. achievement. Yeah. And I think that they, they get caught up in the short-term thinking, and then when they get the funding happens, they don't know what to do beyond that. Yeah, right. funding is a milestone, not a goal. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Agreed. Is there a way you, 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 you caution the people you work with about how they view funding and uh, based on that? Or? I, I always ask every startup founder I work with, uh, you know, what's your plan for the next two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks? 30 years, some yeah. time way out in the future yeah. that's too long for us to comprehend. Um, and that should be your target. That's what, that should be what you're working towards. And as long as you keep that vision in mind, sure. everything else will, will come into play. Um, because I've seen it very often that it becomes all about the next funding round. Yeah. It comes, comes down to, uh, you know, is it going to be bigger than the next one? Am I um, going to look good in front of my peers? And, and unfortunately, you do lose sight of, of your goal. Yeah, you shouldn't have the accounting or the burn rate drive your productization strategy, I think is part of sure, the takeaway. Sure. Yeah. So, but I guess um, in, in that sense, you know, sometimes the valuations outside of the U.S. can tend to be a bit more sane. Yeah. Or, no, are, are, yeah. Are, it just depends how, how the market works, but yeah. yeah. Um, I, often, I often, just the same, I often caution clients or I advise clients if they yeah. aren't sure about valuation issues to consider strongly, probably do too as well, yeah. convertible debt as a... A convertible note. Yeah, that's the first way to do it. Do you have, do you have one of your tricks as well? Do you do yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, com yeah. Well, sometimes uh, investors outside of the U.S. have not seen a convertible note, so mm -hmm. you know, try to talk them in the Series Seed. And I, I think there is a, a kind of a, a process, especially depending on how uh, early the ecosystem is in formation, yeah. you know, to kind of convince them. You know, the convertible yeah. note, convertible security, different options. <laughs> So and that, that it should be simplified. You know? Right. So in one sentence, the convertible note structure is what many angel investors, they're called in the U.S., use for their first investment in a small company. And it is a, 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 a note, a loan of money that will convert into the next round. So you let the professional investors, you hope, in the Series A round or the actual full sure. seed round price the company out. So you have cash in the door, but no voting control from yeah. your investors, and you have the benefit of somebody else pricing the company. It's a very facile tool to use. Yeah, no, it, it, it can work well, but the, the problem I've had sometimes is that you'll explain to the investor that this is a no, this is not right. actually getting equity, yeah. then the round closes and you get a, they call my, the client and the client calls me, it's like, they want to know how much equity they own. Exactly. <laughs> You'll know soon, we hope. <laughs> I think that comes with the ecosystem. Sure. As the ecosystem matures, those things become uh, more commonplace, people understand. Yeah, more. I think it's fre frequency is the key. You know, so. I think the, the idea is that um, you, um, raise money in the West because you get more and you have more competition back in the West, um, but spend it um, in your home base. So, for instance, build your prototype, get your initial traction in your home base, get into an incubator or an accelerator in the West, spend three months there, expose yourself to everybody out there, let them see you and let them see what you're building. Let them see the amount of um, hard work you put into it and, and how much you have achieved with, with how little you have. Um, and then when you have these casual conversations with them, don't ask them for money. Never ask them for money. You, you should not be asking an investor for money. The investor should pitch you to put money into your startup. Um, but show them what you are doing. And if you are actually doing something that is worthwhile, you will get money for it because your valuation will be more reasonable than, than a company back in, back in the West. You say, okay, um, this is what I'm doing. This is how much I've, I've achieved uh, with what I have. Um, if you wanted to uh, partner with what we're doing, 
with these with this much more we could get to this stage we already work quite hard we don't need it per se but it would be nice to have and it would get us there faster but we are still we're going to operate on my terms like you're not going to operate on your terms you don't get a board seat if you're doing a seed round and you you make it very clear that you understand the local market um and you're only out in the west to expose yourself to understand how things are done elsewhere and fathers to kind of get what you are doing i think i think that is a formula for companies in turkey in india in in pakistan and in iran um good, good. only go west to expose yourself not to necessarily raise funding let them chase you after that yeah i think we're almost out of time so any yeah. any final remarks you want to add to this i i think you made a good point about home base i mean that's actually uh you don't need to be in silicon valley to start a, an amazing company and yeah. and actually your home base is your competitive advantage it's yeah. where you feel the most comfortable um yeah. so you can start a company really anywhere yeah yeah absolutely i agree here here well said yes <laughs> all right thank you thank you very thank much thank you very much